Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father, we pray right now for this time in your Word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would just make this message a message that speaks deep into our spirits lord strengthen us down in the innermost part of our being let your words just resound with our spirits so that we could receive those sweet things that will give us strength and and courage and an ability lord hope whatever we might need for this upcoming week you know what lies ahead so we ask you just to impart to each person here that portion what we need you said to ask you each day for our daily bread, our daily portion, we ask you right now, give us that portion that we need for our spirit to be strengthened. And if anyone here be hurting physically, emotionally, maybe their heart is heavy, Lord, they're mourning, we, we, we pray you would let your spirit go and comfort them right now. Even as this breeze is blowing through the, our midst, Lord, we ask you to accompany that blowing with the breath of your Holy Spirit that would just refresh each person here, right to the, to the innermost part of their being. And we ask it in, in your son Jesus' precious name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, this morning we're to Romans 12, 12, where we began last week. I got all the way through the very first part of the verse that says that these are the things what we're to do Well, he said uh, to rejoice in hope. Now, these things are written in this passage. Romans 12, 12 is just part of the paragraph that began earlier in the the book of Romans, back to verse 9, where it says, let love be without hypocrisy. And then it broke down. I believe Paul did one of the best jobs ever of breaking down how to, to love, like with true Christian love, without being a hypocrite. And we saw those things. The very first thing was what? In verse 9, abhor what is evil and cling to what is what? Good. You have to, if you're going to be a Christian that loves with a pure love, you can't be hanging on to evil. You can't be, have your affections after evil. You have to actually abhor it, which means a hatred towards evil to such a, a depth that you turn away from it. You know, there's a difference. There's some guys who's, yeah, well, I tolerate evil. It's around. You know, there's a difference when it comes to really walking in the true love of God that we don't actually get fascinated with evil. You know, have, you have, any of you have friends that they're like fascinated with anything to do with evil? It's like they're almost, you know, it, it, say it's some really sick horror flick or something. They're like, oh, I got to watch that. You're like, why? Oh, I don't know. It just turns some switch in me. I, I don't know. It just, it's fascinating. Well, the Bible says to be simple concerning evil and be wise concerning what is good. We don't really need to know about evil. In fact, I quit a long time ago sharing my testimony about running around with Satanists because it it tended to make everybody who heard it, um, they would say, oh man, I had nightmares after you told your testimony, what you lived through. And I'm like, I wasn't telling my testimony to say, let me give you nightmares. That's just what I lived through. And when people say, would you like to go watch this movie? They've got this scene with some demon-possessed people and stuff. I'm like, no, I did enough of that already. Not interested. Well, aren't you, don't you want to know? I'm like, been there, done that, don't want the t-shirt. You know, I don't need that. And, and, and actually, you don't even need to know about demons. Like, other than the fact they're there, they're real, right? Just like, you know, some, uh, for me, w- what God used demons to do in my life was I realized if they're that real and they, they try to get people to follow them with real fervor, I mean, they really like, you've got to join our club and you've got to sell out. And, and it, it's, you know, it's one of these clubs that it's death in, death out kind of thing. It's really, we're committed. I, I, I re- Listen, I will tell you this. I respect some of my Satanist friends for their commitment. They're wrong, but they're committed. Okay, they have a commitment, a zeal, you know, but for, for evil. Now you say, can God, u- can God use someone who has zeal for the wrong thing? Who's writing this book of Romans? 
Paul the Apostle. What was his name before he was called Paul? Saul. Saul of Tarsus. He was, he was a, a Jew who had the letter in his hand from the authorities to go arrest anyone claiming to belong to this new movement called The Way. Because Jesus said, remember in John, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and nobody gets to the Father except through me. So Jesus being the way, that's what the early church, by the way, was called the way. The, the, the only universal way to God. And by the way, for those of you like myself that was raised Catholic, Catholic in true, its Latin roots means the universal answer. Like the, the only, it, it's, it, it literally comes from the word what the Greeks used and, the, uh, and back to the Hebrew for the answer, the way. So some of you say, like, what, what does it mean? Did, did anybody here grow up Catholic besides me? Do you remember in catechism getting a little Bible for your confirmation and on the front of the Bible it said, the way? As the, the, the Catholic edition that they give you for confirmation says right on the front, the way. Here's your little Bible to start you. I was like, yeah. They believe that. That's the way. The universal answer is Jesus. He's the way, by the way. Not the church. The church is supposed to be pointing to Christ. And if we love without hypocrisy, it really gets a lot more attention to where it needs to go, to, to our Lord and not to us. Because when, when the tension comes to us, uh, it just messes up everything. It gets people, you know their eyes off of the prize. We want to get them to, to look to Jesus. So, first thing we do, we hate what's evil. And we cling, cling to what is good. What was the next thing in verse 10? If you look down with me, this is just a recap so we can get to the part we're getting to today. You be devoted to one another in what? Brotherly, Brotherly love. love. And then you give preference to one another in honor and you don't lag behind in diligence. You be fervent in your spirit Serving who? Yourself, right? No, we went over that. Serving the Lord. This is what, this really is a safeguard to keep us from turning into hypocrites. There are some Christians that serve themselves, not, not Christ. I hate to say that they're in the club because they, they give the rest of us a bad name. You, you ever run into those Christians? It's all about them. Everything's, you know, they, the whole thing is about serving them. When, when in fact, we're supposed to make the whole thing about serving Jesus. And last week we saw the very first part of Romans 12. 12. Our dear sister over here says this was her, her what do we call it, theme verse for life. She, she, she had cancer, was it 11 years ago? Six years ago. Ball, her hair had all come out. And she looked over, and on the front of her Bible was Romans 12, 12. And it said, to rejoice here in what? In hope. And she went, and then it, this is the part we're coming to today. Now, we went over rejoicing in hope last week, but I have to tie it into today's message, so we're going to revisit it. But then it says to persevere in tribulation or trials, hang in there through trials. We'll go over that in detail in a moment. And be devoted to prayer. And she said this was her key verse. God just like speaking a word to her. The thing to do right now was rejoice in hope. And to cling here. Just hang, hang in there through, the tr through tribulations. Persevere. And to continue. Be devoted to prayer. She said I can do those things. Even though she's had cancer. Her hair's all gone and she's feeling terrible. And God said just gave her this word. This passage. Well, guys, this is a really important passage. I mean, rejoicing in hope, we went over in detail last week. How important is hope, anyway, to keep us going? How much should we hang on to the hope what we have as believers? I didn't have time to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but if you, if you want to take a look at, uh, uh, again there at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. We're in Romans 12, 12 today, so I'm going to pick an easy one for you to remember. 1 Corinthians is the next book after Romans. So we'll just up it, one verse, one chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and some of you already know this passage. It's not, it's not new news to you, but it's that, it's that great love chapter. You know, love is patient, love is kind. There in verse 7, love does not, uh, it's not jealous, doesn't brag. All the description of God's love given to us. And at the end of this chapter, 
I love it. It says, now abide in faith. And what's the next thing? Hope. And the next thing? Love. And the greatest of these three is what? Love. Here we are studying back at, as Paul wrote to the church at Rome, that you, we got a love, a, with a love that's not hypocritical. True love. And this love requires us to abide. Now, abide means remain. Stay put. Um, it's literally the word for used in farming when you plant a plant. You know, when you, pu when you put a tree in the ground, hopefully you put it where it gets a good water source, maybe next to the creek or, you know, by the river. And once you put that tree in the ground, you leave it there. You let it abide by the river. Why? Because it's going to send its roots down and it's going to get all that it needs by staying put at that place where it gets the source of its strength. Well, the scripture says for us to abide, like we're the plants getting planted, but what are we planted by? What stream are we drinking from? Here's the, here's a, it's, a, it's a stream that has three different like parts to it, flowing to our roots. Faith, we need faith, right? We need to, and we need to stay in our faith. You know, some people, they, they veer from their faith. They st oh, I used to be in, my, in the faith when I was younger. You ever run into those ones? Oh, yeah, I used to. I used to be a person that, that really had no, faith, hope, and what was that other one? Love. I used to have a lot of hope. But, you know, then I started watching the news, and the world's a nasty place, and I gave up on hope. And, and all of a sudden, their Christianity becomes real weak. It's like the tree just uprooted from the side of the river and went marching out into the desert. It didn't abide where it's supposed to abide. And, and all of a sudden, they're going, oh, I don't know, my tree's not so green anymore. It's not really growing. I'm not really that strong anymore. Well, yeah, because your roots have been uprooted from what you need to get the strength. You need to abide in faith. You need that flowing to you. You need that nourishing your growth. You need hope. That's like miracle grow. I mean, you've got to have hope, right? Without hope, Christianity is... I mean, how do we really do it without hope? And without love, the greatest, the greatest of these three, love, this is, this is just a game. I mean, people who do Christianity without love, are there such things as Christians that do Christianity without love? They're going to straighten out the rest of us, messed up people. Get in line. March to the beat of our drum, you know. And it, to me, some of the, they're some of the meanest Christians. I'm like, you are, you are causing the rest of the world to say, hypocrites, bunch of hypocrites. I'm not going to that church. They were so mean. They were so judgmental. They were so, anyone run into those ones? You're like, whoa, sign of the cross, back off. You know, you're like, what? It's evil. It's because someone didn't teach him this verse. To love without hypocrisy. To do it the way Christ... Oh, by the way, this is just how Jesus would do it. Okay, can you imagine Jesus... Like, just, just picture, how would he treat the people? When they were hurting people? How did he behave with them? He was like, how can I help you? And, and he just... He, he, he literally lived out love. In practicum. Like, he showed us how to love. So here... Paul writes, guys, you got to rejoice in hope. you got to keep revisiting this hope that you have. Don't lose, don't lose that hope that was imparted to you. This, this hope is powerful. We have the hope of everlasting life, no matter how bad it gets. We have the hope that's an anchor to our soul. And this leads into the next thing. He says that you persevere through what? or in tribulations. This is where a lot of Christians are wimps. Something bad starts to happen. They're like, oh no, it's a terrible trial. I quit. You're like, didn't you used to serve the Lord? Oh, I did, but I had a trial. Tribulations came and I quit. There's a lot of young ones that they start off their Christian faith and as soon as they get going, 
something bad happens, they're like, huh, I guess this is too hard. I'm just going to stop. It was easier when I wasn't a Christian. You know what I tell people when you sign up to be a Christian? Get ready for the, get ready for the roller coaster ride. As soon as you put your faith in God, Satan goes, oh, I don't want you to do that. And he'll do everything he can to tempt you, to, 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 to dissuade you. He'll try to trip you up. He'll let trials just plague you, and you'll be like, I don't know, it was easier before. But before, did you have the hope of everlasting life? Did you know that if you died, you'd go to heaven? See, how valuable is that for us? Personally, I think they don't even compare. No matter what we go through down here, we know we're going to heaven. So we can learn a different attitude. Now, these things are things that I believe not all Christians come with, but as we go along in the Lord, he kind of works them into us to where we start to rejoice in our hope. We start to persevere when we're in tribulations. We start to really dig in and pray. Maybe we never even prayed before, but the Lord is going to help us become devoted to prayer. And sometimes, by the way, he does use trials to get us to pray more. Has anyone can give an amen to that? You go through trials. I never had to give a class on, when you're in a trial, don't forget to pray. Because everybody prays already. They're like, yeah, man, I'm going through a trial, man, I'm praying. I'm like, yeah, it's not like automatic. But let me show you something that really ref just, just lives out this attitude in the book of Acts when the guy writing this book is actually going to go through a trial. I I'd like to use, since Paul's the one writing the book, let me use him as an example. If you'll turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 16, now, Paul was over there in Derby and Lystra. Um, he had had a, a vision of a guy from Macedonia saying, come over here to us. Come over to us. And, and because of that vision, some of you are familiar with the book of Acts. Paul had gone originally on his first missionary journey with Barnabas. And, uh, and they, they had brought along a young guy and he abandoned him. He got homesick after just a short while and went back home and they didn't want to, Paul didn't want to take him again. And, and Barnabas was like, no, no, we're going to take him. It's my, my nephew. And anyway, Paul, Paul and Barnabas parted ways. And uh, Silas went with Paul. And they determined they would go back to everywhere they had visited on their first missionary journey. The second missionary journey of Paul was originally, in Paul's mind, we're just going to go back and check on the churches what we already planted. They get going along, and all of a sudden, they're halfway through the journey, and Paul has a vision at night. Begin, we find it in, in Acts chapter 16 that he, he has this vision of a guy from Macedonia saying, come over to us. Come see us. And, and he picks up a young man. Some of you know about this guy. He's kind of, he's one of my favorites, Timothy. This young man that was well spoken of by the brethren at Lystra, they, they picked him up. His, now, Timothy was a, 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 a young man. His mom was Jewish, and his dad was a Greek. So, I don't know if you know their culture, but if you're half Jew, is that, like, good in the Jewish mind? No. That's a big no-no. It's like you're, like, subclass human or something. But Paul picked up this young man, Timothy, a man who he will later write to, we have two books in the Bible called First and Second Timothy written to this young guy saying, there's no one as like-minded in the faith as this young man. So he's going to get to see Paul live out Jesus, okay? I'm going to just use him as the example. Now, guys, you older guys, you got to understand, do younger guys watch us when we, when we live our Christian? Are they looking at us like, you say you believe in Jesus, you say he's there, I submit to you, they watch you like a hawk. And in this chapter, they go on, they pass over to Macedonia. Paul, you know, gets there. And, and, and when they, I'm just, for brevity's sake, jump to verse 14. They meet a woman, a seller of purple fabric. You guys probably heard of her. She was, her name was Lydia. And, and she was, she was a, a worshiper, it says, of God. And she was listening to the word of the Lord through what Paul was sharing. And the Bible tells us she was the first one who opened up her heart to the Lord. First convert in Europe was this woman, uh, Lydia. 
And she just like said, look, if I'm counted worthy, come to my house. Like, I'll, I'll put you guys up. Here's the, you know, and they didn't even plan to go into this place. So now all of a sudden the Lord just provided a place for them to stay on the detour. You know, it's like we kind of had a plan before, but now it's messed up because God told us to go over here. But when God sends you somewhere else, can God take care of you? You know, sure. He just detoured and she gets saved and he, she's like, could you come to my house? I could let you, you know, stay over here. And chapter 16, or I'm sorry. Yeah, here we go. Acts 16, 16. I already did Romans 12, 12 and Corinthians 13, 13. I'm jumping a little, but Acts 16, 16 is where I want to pick up with you in this story now. It happened that when they were going to the place of prayer, that there was a slave girl and she had a spirit of divination that, was, that, that, that met them. And she was bringing her masters much fortune by, by um, or profit by fortune telling. So, you know, can demons do fortune telling? Sure. Oh, you have a, a relative who just died and they were very important to you. Demons know stuff. Don't think they don't know. They can whisper all sorts of conjurings and things. And there was this guy, these guys, they had a slave girl that had demons. And they would let her do people's fortunes just to make money off of her. And she kept following after Paul. And she kept crying out, These men are bondservants of the Most High God. And they're proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Now, we don't know the intonation, how she said this. I mean, remember, she's got a, demons in her. She could have been cackling. <laughs> and these guys, <laughs> they're bond servants of, you know, of God. Yeah, right. And they're trying to tell you the way of salvation. They really, the words are correct. They were bond slaves of the Most High, and they were proclaiming the way of salvation. But I suspect she was probably annoying, because I read ahead. You guys know the story, right? I mean, it says, and so she continued doing this for many days. Now, he, Paul did not like having a demon-possessed person for a forerunner, announcing his ministry. And Paul, it says in verse 18, was greatly annoyed. And he turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And the spirit came out that very moment. And it says, when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace before the authorities. And when they brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion being Jews. And they're proclaiming customs, which are not lawful for us to accept or observe being Romans. So Paul and Silas, listen to what happens. The crowd rose up against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and, and proceeded to beat them and ordered them to be beaten with rods. Now when they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And having received such a command, they threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into the stocks. I mean... I don't know how your preaching's been going, but if, you, if you're preaching and, and you had a possessed person following you, announcing you're a bondservant, announcing the way of salvation, and you get so annoyed you cast the demon out. Instead of the, this shows you the heart of the people. Instead of them rejoicing that this girl doesn't have demons anymore, they're like, there goes our prophet. And, and, and these guys are upset in the whole area with their stupid... They're, they're, they got customs and stuff, and, and we're Romans, and they shouldn't be doing this. Now, how many of you guys know that Paul was a Roman citizen? Did he buy his Roman citizenship? You, you could pay and buy it, but he didn't. He was born in Tarsus, which is one of the big chief colonies of Rome in that day. And he was born Roman, okay? And they're accusing him of doing things that are not lawful to do as a Roman, now, I don't know why Paul didn't play the Roman card right then. I mean, if I was Roman, I would have been like, look, you're beating me without a trial. I'm a Roman. But he didn't do it right away. I don't understand. And some, this is on the easy to, questions to ask when we get to heaven. Don't worry, I got like a big list. But, you know, it doesn't stop me from believing. It's just stuff I want to know once I get there. Like, so why did you wait so long? 
I, I read ahead of two. He's going to use the card. He just doesn't pull it out of the deck yet. Instead, we read this. But Paul, about midnight, now he's thrown into the inner prison, fastened in the, sh in the stocks, you know. They, they did not want this bad guy, preacher, to get away. Put him in the inner prison, lock him in the, in the stocks, and, and it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and they were singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Thinking, what is wrong with these cuckoos? They're got beaten with rods, they're in the inner prison, in the stockade, and they're praising God? Singing the hymns of praise. Now what does it say in Romans 12, 12 you're supposed to do? Rejoice in hope. You're supposed to do what in that tribulation stuff? You're supposed to like hang in there, right? Preserve, per, per, uh, sorry, preserve, that's the wrong one. Persevere, there, thank you. Persevere, I hate English. I have weird words. Persevere in tribulation and you're supposed to be devoted to prayer. What are these guys doing? Now, nobody told them, sing hymns and pray, right? But what do they do? Show us exactly what you do when you're in a tribulation. I don't know if you'd call this tribulation in your book. I would. If I was preaching, they arrested me, beat me with rods, and then you know, stripped me and beat me with rods, and then threw me into the inner prison. I wouldn't put it down in my book, tribulation today. You know, this day sucks. But these guys don't complain. They're sitting there praising God. And all the prisoners are listening to them. And suddenly, this happens every time. Look at verse 26. Suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison house was shaken and immediately, this, this is the part that really is a kicker. What happens? All the doors, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains we're unfastened. That happens every time there's an earthquake, right? You think? Do you think the Lord had anything to do with this one? I mean, so the jailer, when he awoke, saw the, the prison doors all open, and he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. You know why? He's a Roman. And, and the, the, the Roman laws, if you're the jailer, you're guarding the jail, and you let the prisoner escape, then whatever punishment was supposed to be the sentence to the prisoner, where, where does it get transferred to? You. So if you guys got guys on death row or, or scheduled for, you know, flogging or whatever, all the punishment of all the guys you let escape, all is going to be upon you. They, they took their job serious. When he saw that all the doors were open, he wakes up, all the doors are open, he's like, gets his sword out. He's ready to do himself, and this will be much more merciful if I kill myself than if I let my bosses get a hold of me for letting the prisoners escape. Now, as soon as he does this, this is what is the kicker. Verse 28, Paul cries out and says, Stop! Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Now, I would understand if Paul and Silas stayed back, but what about the rest of the fellas? You'd think that they would have gone, My chain just fell off. That was a cool earthquake. Let's get out of here. You know? It's, mi it's midnight, right? They could flee out into the dark. But Paul says, don't do yourself any harm. We are all... Why, why didn't the other guys leave? What, what would keep them there? I believe it was the example of Paul and Silas that maybe they left their cells and came in there and said, hey, you guys, could you tell me some more about this God you serve? Because I never had my chains just fall off and the doors all opened. And Paul, he, he, he tells him, don't harm yourself. And so the, the, the guy in verse 29 calls for lights and they rush in and they're trembling. And it says, and fear, in fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said to them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You're talking about a witness. Like the, the jailer is getting converted right here. And then Paul tells him, verse 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And so they sp spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all those in his house. And he took him that very hour of the night and, and washed their wounds. And immediately 
the man was baptized, he and his household. So the, the guard went and washed Paul and Silas's wounds, cleaned him up. They beat him and threw him into prison. Didn't even, you know, didn't wash the wounds, nothing. Just get infections, die, who cares? And then he brought him to his house. He set food before him and, and he rejoiced greatly having believed in God, him and his whole family. Now the next day came and the chief magistrate sent for the policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the chief magistrates have sent to release you now. Now wait a minute. The magistrate sent to release him. Where has Paul gone to? We know he went to the guy's house and got washed up and, 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 and led them to Christ and baptized them. But do you notice that the policemen have to go back to where? To the jail. Paul willingly went back to the jail after this. And, and the policemen, they sent to the jailer and, and said, bring these guys out and, and, and tell them, go out and go in peace. Get, get lost. You know, we don't want to deal with you. And then Paul said to them, they have beaten us without trial, men who are Romans, and they've thrown us into prison, and now they're sending us away secretly? No, indeed, but let them come out themselves and bring us out. And the policemen went and reported these words to the chief magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were actually Romans. And they came and they appealed to them, and they, and they brought them out and, and, and kept begging them to leave the city. And so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, the gal with the, the seller of the purple fabric, the first gal that got saved. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them, and then they departed. Now, some of you know this story, right? You, you remember Paul getting beaten and, and, and singing the praise songs and the, the prison door thing. That's sometimes a Sunday school story, you know, how the Lord just made all the doors to open and the chains to fall off. But I have a question. How many believe this really happened? Like God really made the earthquake and the chains fall off and the whole... I mean, is that really hard for God? He's going, oh man, this is a tough one. Not sure if I can do chains and stalks and door locks and oh gee this is that's such a <laughs> really this is a piece of cake for the lord right i mean this is nothing i laugh because earlier in the book of acts there was the time when peter got thrown in jail and an angel of the lord was sent to get peter out of jail now john peter and john the one had just gotten killed and, the, and peter gets thrown in jail and the lord comes to peter and peter you know, he's, he, he thinks he's dreaming. Do you remember that passage? Where he, he, it, says, it says that the Lord sent an angel. The angel goes, get up, Peter. Come on. Middle of the night. Time to go. And Peter, Peter thinks he's dreaming because he gets up, right? He must have been a good sleepwalker or something. Because he gets up and he follows. And, the, and as he's following the angel, the doors of the prison are opening. In front of them, they go through, the door closes, they go to the next one, to the next one, all the way out. He gets all the way out, <laughs> he gets all the way out to a hill outside of Jerusalem. And the angel goes, okay, you're free. And a breeze comes, and the breeze is cool. And it, like, you know, like snaps him out of his sleepwalking, I guess. And he's like, how did I get out of here on this hill? He, Wait a minute, am I awake? You know, like, it's for real. I really, th uh, he thought he was dreaming. But see, how many of you read that story in Acts and you thought, that's pretty cool. I mean, could God do that one? Just send an angel, get you, bust you out of jail. You know, I mean, we don't, sometimes we forget how great our God is. And, and, and we struggle because we're in a trial, a tribulation, and it messes with our head, and we, we lose sight of, of, of what we're supposed to keep our focus on, the Lord. And once we get our eyes off the Lord, everything goes downhill. It's like, it's like when Peter was in the boat, remember? And there's that big storm, and Jesus comes walking by on the water, and they're going, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, it's not a ghost, it's me. And Peter goes, if it's you... Really, that's you, Lord? Bid me to come to you. Now, what was Peter's occupation before he w followed the Lord? He was a fisherman. Had he ever been on the Sea of Galilee before? Just a few times. Like his whole life. 
big storm. They're freaked out. And I submit to you, only Peter was the one that said this. Out of all the guys in the boat, only Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And the Lord, you guys know the story. Jesus says, okay, come. Someone was asking me about the movie, The, the Shack, that, um, that is a recounting of a sad story about the girl who gets, you know, abducted and killed and, and how, the, how the father has to deal with it. And they, some people, they want to know my opinion about the story. I said, I, you know, let me tell you, my God is really big. Like, the movie doesn't even make him as big as he really is. But they did a good job in one way to me. In the movie, they let God um, appear to the man in a way that the man could, could stomach it, so to speak. I mean, if God showed up in his glory, what would happen to us? We'd, like f- we'd fry, right? We'd fizzle. It would be like sizzle, sizzle. I mean, pure holy God shows up to unpure Izzy. It'd be like, zot, I'm gone, you know. But, but in the movie, what they did is they, 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 have, they have the Lord come as, as um, with this little cute black lady baking a pie. And, and he's going, your papa? You're, my wife talks to God like real personal, calls, her, calls him papa. And, and the little lady's like going, mm-hmm. But I thought you could stomach this more easily, you know, like I just did this for your sake. Because in the scripture, if you read the Old Testament, the Lord God, uh, he, he revealed himself in different ways to different guys. You know, one place, he's Jehovah Shalom. That's God, our peace. Or Je- Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. Or Jehovah Tzikhanu, God, our righteousness. I mean, he's different. Uh, not, he's not a different God. He just, uh, it's kind of like saying, okay, I got a diamond, big old honking diamond with all the little facets that they cut on it, you know, to reflect the light and the colors. And you can focus on one facet and say, but that facet right there, that one little piece, that little shape this way, that one looks kind of bluish. But over here it looks purplish. And over here it's got a, you know, how the light bends through it. And and you you could, every one of us could be looking at it and seeing different parts and describing it. No, it's really blue. No, it's really yellow. No, I, I see I see some other colors there, you know. And you could argue all you want, but it's the same diamond. It's just many facets. And we have a great, great God. Let's don't put him in a box where he's so little. You know, so some of the Christians got really upset because they used a woman to represent God the Father, but they kind of missed the whole premise of the point. What they were, you know, God was big enough to to and later he shows himself as a man on the day. He says, you're going to need a father for this one. Got this like old wise looking guy that they pick to depict him. But it's not the, the outward shell. It's the spirit of how they represented God as love. That God loved him through this tragedy and God helped him through the tragedy. And I was like, that's, that's, God, that's biblical right there. That's our God. He, he helps guys through stuff. And he does stuff way beyond what we... It's nothing to him to, to do some great marvel. It's nothing to him to take a guy sound asleep and say, get up, let's go. You're locked up in jail, but, but I need to work with you some more and we're not done. Or how about when Paul, do you guys remember when Paul preached the gospel and they got so mad at him, they stoned him to death? I mean, it's worse than this day. This was a bad enough they got locked up, beaten with rods. There's, there's a day coming in the book of Acts when they're going to, beat him and they're going to throw rocks at his head till he dies and they're going to throw him over the wall of the city into the city rubbish heap where they threw the trash just this is how much they cared about this preacher he is going to get stoned not this kind stoned i mean (laughs) stoned in the head and they're going to kill him and throw him over the wall and then and then the lord's going to say to him get up paul we're not done I mean, you talk about persevering through tribulation. This guy is going to go through the ringer for the Lord's sake. He'll be beaten. He'll get, he'll get um, the flogging from the, from, from the authorities. He'll have, he says, five times I received 39 lashes. Five times. He was beaten. They, 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 they call it 40 save one. 40 in their culture was we could beat you 
to death with 40 lashes. We're going to hold back. We're going to beat you within one lashing of death. We'll leave you alive to suffer. He had that five times. The guy writing this, just so you know, it's not like... I, I kind of like... I don't do well... I don't know about you guys. I don't do well when some guy's trying to tell me do something, but they don't really know what they're talking about. They never lived it. They didn't really have to go through it, you know. Like, oh, be of good courage, but I've never... I've had a soft, easy life. You know, I don't know about you. I, I had a, a little bit of a rough life. So when a guy who has had a rough life is telling me how to make it, something inside me goes, I can connect with that. When this guy who's had a sp silver spoon in his mouth his whole life and never had to work, never had to do nothing, you know, is trying to tell me, hang in there. When, when my finances are like, can't rub two nickels together, and he has no idea what it feels like to have to like go, God, I need you to come through. Like when you said, give us this day our daily bread, I mean today. You know, some people don't know what it's like to have nothing, nothing, where you gotta have daily bread today. And when, and when, they, when they talk to you like, you know, their pantry is full of food and they're like, oh, we have nothing to eat. You know, we're going to have to go get some steak and lobster or something. There's just nothing in the house. And you open their pantry, it's like walk-in. It's like a grocery store. And they're telling you, it's like, I have a hard time with that. But when I listen to the words of Paul, the guy who really went through it, and, and I see his, he, he's more one of those guys that models it. He lived it. He's beaten, he's in prison, and he didn't pull the Roman card. I, I, it's on my list. Why'd you wait so long? But if he would have pulled that card out earlier, do you think the jailer would have got saved? What about the jailer's family? See, God had a few more folks to include and maybe he just made one of those rods hit Paul in the head so hard he didn't even think of it. Or maybe he just said, Paul, don't say it yet. We don't know. I'm going to ask him when we get to heaven. But what I do know is the outcome was God showed off pretty good, making all those doors open and making all the folks not run. Because if just one of them would have run, that jailer could have had his head on a platter. I mean, what, what if one of the, the murderers ran off? But the murderers didn't. They all went, must have gone to Paul's cell. What, why are you guys still singing? And why aren't you running? I bet you Paul took that very moment to preach the gospel to the rest of the prisoners. He's just that kind of guy. I mean, when they lock him up later in the Bible, in the book of Acts, it, it says with the whole praetorian guard, they shackled a guy to him round the clock. And I love this. I can just picture it in my mind, Paul going, hey, I got you for the next eight hours. So do you know about Jesus? <laughs> you know, I mean, it says that the faith of the gospel went through the, out the whole praetorian guard. I bet. Because once one of them got saved, look, look, your turn. You know, I already spent eight hours with that preacher. Next, you know, and Paul, I could just see Paul. Oh, fresh meat, let's go. You know, every time they locked a new guy to him, he just preached the gospel to them. Till they all got saved. He didn't get freaked out about the tribulations that he went through. Something in him persevered. Now, I want to submit an idea to you just to help you in case you struggle with persevering in your tribulations. And here's what I want to submit to you. When Paul got saved, he was Saul. He had a letter. He was out killing the Christians, locking them up, getting them beaten. And the Lord Jesus appeared to him, it says, at noon. But as, as the sun brighter than the noonday, this light appeared. Remember, the scripture says God is light. Here's one of his revelations. He shows up so bright that Paul is blinded. And he's going to be blind for the next three days. And he's going to say to him, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth me? And Saul comes back with a real quick comeback. Who art thou, Lord, that I might serve thee? 
And he said, I am Jesus. And then it says in the book of Acts, for the next three days, while Paul is blind physically, Jesus told him something. Does anyone know what it says in the book of Acts that he told him? She said it right here. How much he was going to what? Be blessed. Oh, the glory of being a Christian, right? He didn't say that, did he? The Bible tells us, Jesus told him, this is how much you're going to suffer for my name's sake. He was what we'd call baby Christian. Intro to Christianity 101, done by class, led by Jesus. This is a one-on-one -on -one course. Jesus with Paul. First thing he says is, well, it was Saul. Saul means handsome, desirable. It's uh, Hebrew for GQ. You know, front of the mag. That's what it is. It's it, it, it literally is the the masculine tense for handsome. You know, real desirable, hot stuff. You know, uh, in the guy form. That was his name. Now, if you had that name, I mean, come on, guys. Does, do names rub off on people? Like, I mean, do some people just live up to their name? I can just see this guy full of himself. Yeah, what's your name? I'm Saul. Jesus goes, we're gonna, <clears throat> we got to work on that. We're not going to call you Saul anymore. From now on, you're going to be called Paul. Now, y if you don't know Hebrew, it doesn't mean anything to you. Just one letter change. But it has a big meaning change. Because Saul, though it's <sighs> hot stuff, Paul means little. You're too full of yourself. We're, instead of calling you hot stuff, we're going to call you little one. Little. Well, Put a little pin in that thing and bring it down a little few notches. And now we're going to start your seminary experience with Jesus. First, we've got to blind you to this world because you obviously got the wrong perspective. So he doesn't even let him physically see for three days. Instead, he lets him to have one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. And Jesus says, now I'm going to show you what you're going to suffer. You put my church through suffering. You persecute my church. And by the way, Jesus takes that very personal. Because by the way, Jesus wasn't on the earth when, when Saul was running around doing this. Who was Saul picking on? The Christians, right? The believers, the followers of Christ. And Jesus was Sicilian, I'm sure, or little. He's Jewish, I know, but... See, because I grew up Sicilian. In our family, if you pick on anyone in my family, you pick a fight with me. I was raised that way. My father taught me, if someone picks on your sister, you go take care of it. It's like they picked a fight with you. You know, like, you're the old. Uh, I'm the oldest in the family. So, oldest boy, my job is to look out for my little sisters, my little brothers. Anybody picks on them, they're going to get a fight with me. And I took his, I, you know, when your father tells you this, you have to take it serious, you know. He taught me how to fight, combat fighting, and I was like, you picked on my sister, that's it. You know. I got drugged to the, my first time to the principal's office because I dropped a guy on the playground who had grabbed my sister's, this part, he said, breast. He thought, oh, he'd be funny. I said, don't touch my sister there. What are you going to do about it? What my dad said, huh, huh. <laughs> he's on the ground. I was like, I didn't even do the third move yet. <laughs> and then the principal says, He's telling my father over the phone what, what happened. And he's, the, my father said, put him on the phone. So, yes. And my father tells me right away, speak only in Italian. Tell me what happened. So I tell him what happened. Guy put his hand on my sister's breast and he was, you know, wouldn't stop. And I told him to stop or I'm going to, you know, have to defend her. And he didn't believe me. So I defended her. I said, and I only did the first two things what you taught me. And he was already on the ground gasping. And I don't know, we're pretty good, Dad. He says, hand the phone back to the principal. And I hear my dad. I, my dad, who's very calm, doesn't really raise his voice. I can hear him yelling at the principal. If you do anything to my son, my son defended my daughter's honor. And you just going to, you know, you, 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 you better take that other boy and have him dealt with. The other boy got suspended. I got to go back to class. I was like, okay. It's all right. That's what you're supposed to do, right? That's, and Jesus is the same way. Only to Saul, he's like, why do you persecute me? 
But Jesus already ascended, was seated at the right hand of God. He wasn't down here. This is how, how much I know Jesus is in the church. Because when we get picked on, Jesus goes, you pick on them, you're picking on me. And for three days, he said, this is what you're going to suffer. Now, should we tell people that they're going to suffer being a Christian? Right out of the gate. Wait a minute, Jesus did. He's obviously did it wrong, right? We need to soften the gospel a little. We need to, pastor, you need to be more sensitive. Baloney. The good Lord told Saul, dude, we're changing your name to Paul and you're going to suffer. You made others suffer and now you're going to suffer. And you know what the irony is? Knowing he was going to suffer, did he quit? Did he say, ah, it's going to be too hard. I'm not going with it. No. He stuck it out. He is one of the guys. Here he is saying in Romans, you guys persevere in your tribulation. Pers hang in there. But did he have to have tribulations? Read the book of Acts, man. This guy went through it. And yet, he has something that I think we got to be careful. We, see, American Christianity is very soft. They like to leave out anything. Like, they tell me, don't preach about the blood. That's gory. Jesus' blood was shed for our sins. Oh, what can wash away my sin? What am I supposed to say? Only the detergent of Jesus. <laughs> no. That does not how the hymn goes, right? Only the blood of Jesus can take away my sin. And if it seems distasteful to some people, I'm sorry, I'm not the right guy. My wife will tell you, I just don't have enough crap. Um, what did she say? I'm not polished enough. Crass was my middle name, she said, when she met me. When I would tell someone about the gospel, like, you're screwed up, you need Jesus. I'm pretty sure I recognize screwed up. I was screwed up, but you have me to the 10th power, so you pretty much really need him. I had no trouble telling people, this is it, man. And you know, when you come to the Lord, you're going to suffer because you made a lot of other people suffer. So just letting you know, join the club. You need it. Now, the irony is that as crass as I was, the people who I straight, was straight with and told them, you're going to be a Christian. It's not going to be easy. Those ones are still serving the Lord today. But I have met a many, a many Christians that came to Christ in some wonderful group revival that everything was just, oh, it's so glorious. The worship was great. And we all just said, Jesus, thank you. And, and nobody prepared them for the trials and the tribulations that lie ahead. Nobody told them. You know, they didn't read them what it says in John chapter 16. You remember the end of John 16? Jesus' words... In this world ye shall have many praise sessions. And be of good cheer. I have no, that's not what it says, does it? In this world ye shall have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I'd rather tell you straight. You welcome to the club, get ready for trials, get ready for tribulation. And persevere through them. Don't quit. Just because you go through a trial, that's, that's ridiculous. We're talking everlasting life here. It is worth hanging in there. If you've got to go through some trials or tribulations, okay, suck it up. Do it. You will make it. You will live. It's okay. You might not live comfortably. It may not be easy. But you have something to hold on to that is so worth it. You have everlasting life. You have hope. And you have a God who hears your prayers. And you're allowed to do all three of those things. You rejoice in hope. You persevere in that tribulation. And you be devoted to praying. There is so much power in prayer. Next week I'm going to start off with the power in prayer. Because I want to show you a few of Paul's answered prayers. Just, you know, just to keep the theme rolling with him. Might, it might boost your faith when you hear how the Lord did some prayer answering. And some of you, you, you need some answered prayers. Just hang in there. Just be, don't quit on your prayer life. It says, Paul says, be devoted to it. That, well, they were singing hymns and doing what? 
when they're in jail. Praising God and they're praying. Oh God, we're here. I, wouldn't you? Did it, who taught them to do that? Do we really need to be taught to do this in tribulation? Not really. We pray automatic. In fact, I, 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 I want to end with this. How about when it's going good? Do you How's your prayer life when, when things are going good? Do you keep praying? Or do you just remember to pray when it's bad? Because I think we should pray all the time. The Bible says pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. Just, just always keep praying. Don't, don't ever give up on prayer. Because God is a God who hears our prayers. And he answers. And next week, well, we've got a couple more of the practical things to do. There's two more that we're going to look at. So we'll, we'll begin with prayer and go on to the practicing of hospitality in a, in a true way. And that, that's all I got for today. Just don't end. Sorry. <laughs> they got to make a, like, edit it and do the thing for the radio and the YouTube. So we'll pick up here next week. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your holy scriptures and the encouragement that they bring. And I pray as we go from here, Lord, you'd make us a people that could well, learn from these great examples, what you have put before us in the scripture, Lord. Some of us have great examples of, of, of folks of faith that you have placed in our lives even right now. So thank you for those people, those endearing saints that have set the, the, the model, Lord, how we can follow you and hang in there. And if anyone here is struggling in their faith, Lord, I just pray today you would just give them a boost to just help them continue to hang in there. Help them to rejoice in your hope. And help them, Lord, just to persevere through their tribulations. And, and Lord, we all want to continue to be devoted in prayer. Just help our prayer life. Just turn the dial up for each of us. That we be a truly a people that speak to you. And pray to you. As we go from here now, we end in prayer. Not ending prayer, but, but just ending our time of, in your word. Keep us in a spirit of prayer. Throughout the rest of this week, we pray until we're back together. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We'll sing a closing song. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.